Hello, dear friends and colleagues, and greetings from MM Seminars uh, here in Athens, Greece. Now, as time goes by, we all formulate our theories and way of thinking. And me, after graduating from the uh, dance school in the University of Athens, I did my prosthodontic training at Ohio State University, and then went on to Geneva, Switzerland, where I did my thesis in operative dentistry. And having both of the words of restorative dentistry gave me some things that I realized over time that the way I was thinking of some things was not the same as with other colleagues. So that's why the reason that I put up together uh, this sole presentation with another view of the so-called feral effect. Now, we all know that when we have an adult to treat teeth, we have a lot of problems. Um, and we have a, uh, it's quite difficult due to the missing tooth structure. Even we, if we want to place a crown on the tooth, we have a problem because our crown does not have a lot of resistance and uh, retention. So that's why we have to place a post and core and then make a crown. Now, as, we, as I mentioned before, we, in different parts of the world, uh, and not to treat teeth are associated with problems. And in order to try to find out what causes the problem, uh, we try to find out what's important. And a lot of research has been done on, on what's the best form of crown to put on an the treated teeth, or what is the best uh, post and core system to use. Is it metal? Is it cast? Is it uh, glass fiber, carbon fiber, composite resin? What is the best material to make our post and core? To my mind, uh, the most important is the existing tooth structure. And the more uh, to structure we have, the less problems we have, and especially we need to structure the cervical area, and this is associated with the term ferro effect. Now, uh, when we look at the glossary of prosthodontic terms, it doesn't have the term ferro effect, but just ferro, and it says it's a metal band or ring used to fit the root or crown of a tooth. So more or less, this corresponds to the area of the crown, or the cervical area, that Inside, we have to structure and know the person core. Now, um, I have to apologize as English is not my feral, my uh, native uh, language. We went, I went to Wikipedia and we see that the ferrule is also associated with an um, object used to fastening, joining, sealing, or reinforcing um, an object. So the uh, the things we uh, associate it with, it's quite common, is the barrel, the rings around the barrel that seems to keep the barrel in place so that it doesn't open when it has liquid inside. So it's more or less like a ring that goes around the tooth and protects the tooth from splitting. Now my question is that when we have uh, a barrel, we have liquid inside and the liquid inside has hydro hydraulic pressure which tends to split to open the barrel. I'm not sure whether we have the same thing in the tooth. I mean, um, even though when we have forces, there's always forces, um, if you have lateral forces, we have some, um, not vertical, but some uh, lateral uh, vector of the force, but I'm not sure we have them in both sides. And even though when we have vertical forces that tend to uh, more or less, as we say, split the teeth, act like a wedge, uh, the crown we resist as it, um, as it holds in the margins, does not have a vertical movement, cannot go down. So uh, I'm not sure whether exactly the barrel and the hydraulic pressure inside the barrel is an exact parallel to what happens inside the tooth, as meaning that we don't have always pressure inside the tooth that tends to split uh, the tooth uh, right in the middle. So once again, um, I'm not sure what is the correct uh, parallel or feral effect, but to my head, the, this thing with the barrel is not 100%. So, in my mind, what I had is that uh, the, uh, looking at the basic principle of fixed prosthodontics, that's why I say fixed prosthodontics one of one, in my mind, the most important uh, uh, part is, let's look at the basic, after the treatment planning of every fixed prosthodontic books, when it comes to preparation, we talk about retention form. And the retention form is the feature of the tooth preparation that resists dislodgement of a crown in a vertical direction or along the path of placement, whereas resistance form is the feature of the tooth that enhances the stability of restoration and resists dislodgement along an axis other than the path of placement. Both are extremely important. So when we're looking about um, a tooth, we talk about the taper, 
and this is the inclination between the actual walls of our preparation and looking at some um, uh, a very uh, famous publication by Dr. Gutekar Campani and Colino. Campani was the ex um, uh, director of the program at Ohio State, but even when I went there after he had left, his influence was still present. We know that uh, it's very important when we have a preparation, the facial lingual aspect of our preparation. Uh, if it's not parallel mesial distally, it's not, it is always a problem, but more or less the teeth cannot tip mesial or distally since we have uh, adjacent teeth, if we have contact points. Well, on the contrary, facial lingual, since we have the, uh, the cheek or the, or the of the tongue, we don't have a solid stop, so that's why it's very important to have our preparation uh, as parallel as possible in the facial uh, aspect. Now, looking at the tooth, which is more important? Is it the upper, the middle, or the cervical third of our preparation? If we, if we have a typical um, uh, preparation like here, as we see, if, if more or less we have, uh, I'm not sure if I can say in English a uh, proper um, explain uh, this geometry thing, but we are all aware with it. If we have taper, we have no resistance and because the crown is very easy to be dislodged. On the other hand, if we have parallel walls, especially as we see in this uh, graphic um, design, especially in the cervical part, we do have a resistant form. And this is extremely important and has been shown by various um, publications that this is uh, very, very useful. So, in order to have resistance form, the cervical third of our preparation seems to be the most important one. Now, as far as the height of our preparation goes, uh, we are quite lucky um, because uh, sometimes we have, sometimes we do not have, but we have also research that shows the minimum height that's available, and we see that it's 3 millimeters for the premolars and the anterior teeth and 4 millimeters for the molars. Now, um, thank God, uh, sometimes in the buckle and lingual aspect we have more available to structure and that helps us because as I mentioned before it's very important that we have to structure buccally and lingually and sometimes initially this if we don't have uh, enough this has can be compensated by the fact that we have an adjacent tooth structure so the tooth cannot, our crown is not very easily to move measurably uh, and distally. But let's keep in mind that we have three to four millimeters of minimum height for anterior and posterior teeth. Um, now, if at the cervical third, let's say we have 1.5 to 2 millimeters of solid tooth structure around the tooth which is parallel to one another, this would correspond if the cervical third is, if we multiply this by three, we have a height of a preparation which is 4.5 to 6 millimeters. So more or less is higher than our minimum requirements of three to four millimeters. It's always higher, four and a half to six is always higher than that. So more or less, if we have enough tooth structure, 1.5 to two millimeters, at our cervical third, our preparation will have resistance form. Now what happens if we have less to structure on top of that. As the crown diminishes, we will have problems with retention. Uh, don't let me be misunderstood. This will be a problem, but our preparation, even though when the crown diminishes, will have resistant form, even if we only have 1.52 millimeters just at the cervical end. This would correspond to a preparation that had uh, was 4.5 to 6 millimeters in height, and it would be easy for us to make our crown reconstruction with a simple, let's say, um, um, uh, resin composite or amalgam restoration and have no problem in our restoration. Now, the funny thing happens that if there is a hole in the middle of a tooth, and we're talking about endodontic retreated teeth, okay, this area of the tooth is immediately called ferrule effect. So it's this area. Uh, below our post and restoration, and this is automatically called a ferrule effect. Now, to my mind, it is not this ferrule effect, this two structure of the cervical end has to do with the resistance form of our preparation and has nothing to do with making the crown holding the teeth not to split. 
It's just that, that our restoration will have, uh, our sorry, preparation will have resistance form, and then the core buildup, our post and core or simple core buildup on top of that, gives the necessary retention of our preparation for our crown to stay in place because we need enough preparation area for our lutein cements to keep our crown in place. So we put it all together, retention is given by the whole circumference and sometimes we need our core buildup, whereas the cervical end is what gives resistance to our preparations. So if we have, if you've seen this graphic design, if you have more or less or even not at all to structure above our, our um, our cervical preparation. To my mind, it's not that we have a feral design, as we see on the left, a lot for a crown to grab, little or, uh, or less. It's not a feral effect. If you see in this graphic design, um, if you have, we may put a prefabricated post and core and make a crown build up, or it can be a cast post and core. But what happens, if you have a force, it's very simple, this force, if you have a lateral force, we, it can be uh, more or less analyzed in vertical and horizontal uh, vectors. And it's, it's, the, it's the horizontal vector that um, we have to think about when it comes to stability. And if we have dislodgement of the tooth, then we can have a little more or even more um, movement of our posterior core, depending on how much tooth structure we have to withstand these lateral forces. So to my mind, it's not a feral effect that is important, but it is simply the resistance form of our preparation given by the existing tooth structure. And if you have enough tooth structure, as we see on the left-hand side, then it is the tooth structure that can withstand the lateral vector of the forces. If you have a little bit of tooth structure, then part of um, the resistance has to be given by the post and core, but if you have none, um, no two structure above, then all the resistance has to be given by the post and core. And depending on the material of the post and core and the flexibility of our of the of the of the crown buildup, then we may have forces. If we go all the way to the right hand side, we may have forces that uh, strictly are being transferred to the root and we ha may have disimentation of the post and core or we may even have fracture of the teeth. Now, please don't get me be misunderstood. We always need, it's very good if we have minimum of one to two millimeters at the cervical area. It's also important that we have parallel actual walls that the existing tooth structure totally encircles the tooth and we don't have missing part um, in some area, um, our preparation must end on sound to structure and we do not invade the, the, the periodontal ligament in order to make our uh, more to structure. But whether we call this a uh, feral effect or whether we call it resistant form of a preparation, I think it's not as important as it may sound, but in some other parts of, uh, of life, even though we may say one thing, with the same, with different terms, whether the cup is half full or half empty, it has a lot to do with how we see life and what's our prospect of restoring endodontically treated teeth. So, as far as uh, our basic fixed prosthodontic uh, thinking, retention is being given by the post and core, but the most important is not retention, but it is the resistant form that can be given by the existing tooth structure at the cervical third of our preparation. And if you have tooth structure, we will not have a problem in it or not in the treated teeth because our preparation will have resistant form given by the tooth structure. Now, I like this um, publication uh, of finite element analysis on feral design because, of course, we can find the literature whatever we're looking for, but uh, this um, uh, um, publication is quite the same with my way of thinking. And when we see um, different areas of the tooth, like for example in the particle size of uh, upper incisors, when we have a lot of tooth structure in the lingual 
part I've seen on the right hand side, uh, this will this will help the tooth not to move. And you can see this more or less, it's very obvious this gives us resistance form. Whether if we, do, we don't have a lot of tooth structure, then more or less it's quite easy for the crown to be dislodged. So it has more to do with sorry, excuse me, with uh, resistance form than anything else. And if we do not have it, it's quite easy for our crown to be, uh, as it moves, uh, it's either for the, here, the, the crown, the, the post and curve was not solid, so thank God um, we had a breakage of a crown. Some of the times we have problems and we have breakages in the root. Now, if we have a solid, uh, post and core, then we, we have problem because as the crown is being uh, is moved, then we may have compression forces in the buccal side. And as we see in <clears throat> in a picture that a colleague sent to me, he observed this crack on the buccal side, but the coast the post and core was an old ceramic post and core too hard as it was moving, uh, we saw this crack on this area. And this is a problem. And this is the reason why, when we see more or less, uh, not exactly helpless, but this teeth was referred to my private practice uh, about 10 years ago for uh, an implant. But the patient, when we asked, when we discussed about him, if he would think of doing, giving another shot uh, to the tooth, make it, make it try and try to restore it with um, conventional uh, way, he agreed. And I don't want to go into details with the post and core. This was not actually this was this was my first uh, glass fiber post I placed, and uh, I even burned it a little bit. As you can see when I cut it, I don't want to go into details because it's not the best uh, post and core restoration. But the plain fact of the matter remains that the tooth is still in the mouth many many years down the road, and. When the patient uh, called me some years later after the uh, placement of the tooth that she had uh, an accident and they hit the front teeth and it, um, it hurts, to my mind, um, came uh, I thought about the lateral that I had problems, that I broke the tooth. But um, and, uh, this was not the case. Um, it was the metal uh, post and core on the central incisor that caused problems and uh, broke the root of the tooth. Now, what caused it, and was it the material, uh, the shape and size, or the cementation technique used for this post and core? I cannot comment, and um, we can never be sure. But to my mind, we need more flexible materials for the post uh, and core restoration. But um, this is a, a subject for another uh, short presentation. I hope. I was able to give you some uh, new point of view and some old rusty ideas and um, I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your attention.